Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Margot Black, organizer with Portland Tenants United, which is dedicated to organizing tenants to take action to strengthen and enforce tenant rights and protection. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, you have a very uh, large and important mission. So t tell me, well, first of all, let me tell you, I have owned a house now uh, for 35 years. But the all those years before that, which would be almost 30 years, I was a renter. Mm -hmm. And we were renters when I was a kid growing up. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things that you talk about resonate very strongly with me mm -hmm. uh, on a very personal level. And I particularly remember, I'll let you talk soon. <laughs> uh, I, I particularly remember growing up uh, and renting a house and the house was marginal mm -hmm. at best and then getting uh, rent increases and what, where do we move? Mm -hmm. How do we do that mm -hmm. in the struggle mm -hmm. for my mother, particularly? Mm -hmm. You know, we were we were little, yeah, uh, but we, it was still a stressful thing for us too. So anyway, <laughs> tell me what motivated you to be involved with this particular issue. Well, um, I also rented a lot with my mother as a child. Um, my mother uh, suffered from mental illness and was always kind of living precariously, and so. My memories of renting are lots of actually getting evicted and having to move until I um, moved in with my grandmother when I was five or six and had the absolute you know, privilege and benefit of growing up in a, a lovely home in a residential neighborhood and going to the same school and knowing all my neighbors and you know, given a lot of uh, factors associated with my childhood and having a parent with profound mental illness. Uh, there's a lot of ways for things to go wrong mm -hmm. um, and I credit a lot of my own you know personal success and confidence with uh, housing stability in a good you know neighborhood with good neighbors um, I, uh, I got pregnant as a teenager um, when I around the time that I left um, Salt Lake City where I was raised and moved to Portland Oregon um, and uh, when my daughter was six months old um, we were living in a small apartment complex in um, Raleigh Hills and by small I mean you know 20 units or something um, friendly with the property managers and all the neighbors, and um, and uh, my you know, my first six month lease was was coming up to you know was was ending, and they sent a letter um, saying that I had 30 days to move, um, and with with no reason, uh, no recourse. Um, I was 19. Um, I was very recently a now a new single mom. Um, my grandmother had just died, so my safety net was gone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just remember being so uh, confused and, and devastated. And you know, I called the property management company, and they um, they said they didn't have to give me a reason, um, but that they'd give me a good reference. Um, it was only happening to me, not to my neighbors. They said there was nothing I could do about it. You know, they did tell me it's not an eviction. Eviction doesn't go on your record, but that didn't change the fact that I had to move. Um, you know, now as I, when I moved in, I had a partner. When I moved out, I was single and carless and mm -hmm. had a six month old daughter. I did move to Hillsboro um, before the max had, um, it was, the max was just about to go online. So then I had to take uh, cabs to work, mm. walk my daughter in the rain to a new child care provider on, um, you know, along busy streets. And um, I lost my job because I couldn't get there reliably on time. Um, and, uh, you know, again, sort of would have, would have um, experienced it would have just been the, the, the um, picture book or the poster child of what can go wrong with housing insecurity, but um, I had a, a good family friend who'd also moved up to Portland at around the same time who took me in and let me um, live, let my daughter and I live with him for four years rent free, and I was able to go to college oh. and get, you know, right my ship and, uh, you know, take care of my daughter and provide for her and, and go on to graduate school. And, and again, here is the outcome, um, the, the transformative outcome of stable housing on somebody who would otherwise be very vulnerable. Now living with, you know, um, 
your parent, what he gave me is something that middle class parents often can do for their children in their 20s if they are, you know, not quite ready to yeah. live in the mm -hmm. wild yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, for, you know, for all those folks who don't have, you know, middle class parents with housing security who can bring their children in and say, stay here until you get on your feet, what do they do? So. Um, so I was very fortunate to have experienced that, but um, so many folks aren't. And what really propelled us to start Portland Tenants United was, you know, fast forwarding 10 years, coming back to Portland shortly after post-housing crisis, graduate school and coming back um, in 2011, um, struggling to find um, a uh, an apartment or a house that we could afford on professional salaries, double income professional salaries, mm -hmm. but with three kids, you've got child care and health care and, you know, and everything else. Um, and, you know, so we had our own personal, um, our own personal struggle with it. And I, you know, I just remember thinking I might get priced out of this town. And I, I just, it just hadn't occurred to me that that would happen. You know, mm -hmm. Portland really was, um, was more accessible mm -hmm. than, uh, than it ha had been. And around the same time, um, on Facebook and a lot of parenting groups, because my kids, my, my two younger kids were very little, I just started hearing more and more and more stories from moms, lots of single moms, who were getting no cause evictions, who were getting three, four hundred dollar rent increases, um, who couldn't, you know, couldn't find anywhere to live in their kid's school district or in their neighborhood or near their family or in the city of Portland or even in the suburbs and were panicking, they were living in cars, they were losing their jobs, they were taking on um, too, mu too much extra work that was preventing them from being able to care for their kids or, or do so safely. And I just thought, gosh, uh, how, like, why isn't anybody talking about this? Mm -hmm. um, and that was about the time that I started to get to sort of um, pay attention to what, who was talking about it in the community. Community Alliance of Tenants, um, had, had been around almost 20 years and they um, were doing really great work. I met with their executive director a couple different times just to find out how people can get engaged and involved um, and really what our leverage is. You know, so much of the renter, um, you know, the problem with renting uh, in a fairly unregulated Wild West housing market, private housing market that we have in Oregon um, as opposed to New York or California mm -hmm. is just complete powerlessness. Like, you, you know, you have some laws on the books, but the mm -hmm. only way to enforce them is to sue your landlord. And that's a lot of work and a lot oh, of yeah. risk. Yeah. And so we thought we really want to leverage our power of paying rent. You know, we want to be able to talk about a rent strike. We want to use direct action. We want to really um, confront this in a pretty agitational, aggressive, unapologetic way. Um, and so in, in terms of whether or not, you know, do we, do, do folks join Community Alliance of Tenants? Yes. Um, and or do we start something else where we can kind of uh, be a little bit more aggressive if we want to, you know, does the, does the city have a need for that? And the, the answer seemed to be yes. And mm -hmm. so we came together to really form a tenants union and leverage that power of strike and organize the way uh, labor unions do and really create a solidarity model, one for all, all for one. Yeah, and so that that um, model of forming a union is quite different. I mean, it's not something that tenants have, at least in this area, have done. Is, is that a model that's used elsewhere? Well, actually, they have done that in this area. Well, they so have. Okay. Um, they haven't done it recently. Um, the last time we saw a tenant union organizing um, in Oregon was in the late 70s. Um, it's actually why mobile home park owners have, uh, a, so they own the home, they own their mobile home, but they rent the land underneath mm -hmm. them. Um, and they organized in the late 70s, um, and they have significantly stronger rights than uh, the rest of the, the renter renting mm -hmm. class in Oregon. Um, they also were responsible for what almost, um, we almost had rent control. There was a, a ballot measure, either a ballot measure or a city council vote in Springfield and maybe both um, in the late 70s that narrowly failed. And then um, I want to say in 81 is when the state legislature responded um, to that close call by banning um, cities from having local rent control ordinances. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't, the history of the union is, um, 
there, there isn't a whole lot written down that I have been able to find. This is pre-internet, obviously. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. um, but actually, tenant unions, um, whether they're building-based or neighborhood-based um, or city-based, um, isn't a new idea. Um, and a lot of the stronger renter protections um, from in California and in New York and New Jersey have um, been the result of um, tenant union organizing. Uh -huh. And rent strikes, uh, they're, they're hard to find information on, and I'm a little conspiratorial about that. I think it's... <laughs> I was just going there myself. I <laughs> think the information has been deliberately uh, buried. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. But uh, rent strikes are um, a thing that have been effective tools, um, mm -hmm. you know, usually building-based, but um, there are, there's, you know, organizing that has happened across the world um, that have called for large-scale um, rent strikes that mm -hmm. ha, has it, have achieved results. Okay. So w when did you actually form the Portland Tenants Union? Well, we, Tenants United? Uh, Portland Tenants United, um, we started meeting in June of 2016. Oh, okay. All right. So not, not really very long. No, about two uh, years ago. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. And so what have you done in that time? Um, a lot of learning about organizing in the labor movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you didn't have any organizing experience beforehand? No, and I think that is actually what makes um, PTU kind of special is that um, uh, the folks who originally came around the table and a lot of the folks who've come to the table since then, especially who've brought a lot of energy and, and anger and enthusiasm, um, don't have any organizing experience and they are really um, agitated and radicalized through their own experiences as renters and they're like what can I do um, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and so we've tried you know done a lot of stuff that uh, that more seasoned organizers have been like I can't believe that worked you know? <laughs> or, or we never would have done that you know? oh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and it you know and, and it's because we didn't know any better which uh -huh, was great right, uh -huh. um, <laughs> and we've been making up a lot of stuff as we've gone along mm -hmm. um, so we have organized a few buildings um, and uh, have achieved results through that, um, both in in assisting the tenants in those buildings with their demands. I mean, we had um, we had a, a set of tenants who basically saw the writing on the wall um, with some um, more frequent and higher in, uh, rent increases coming down the pipeline, who preemptively organized because a lot of them had lived there five, 10, 20 years, um, and they uh, they were then. Our, their organizing efforts were met with a new lease from a new property management company that was um, uh, really not uh, in the tenant's interests at all and they wanted to negotiate it and the property management company, Grid Property Management, said the, the lease is non-negotiable. Uh, and we said, well, we, we don't think that's true. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Every contract <laughs> is, is negotiable. Uh, yeah. um, we, uh, on a very cold, very rainy um, Monday morning at um, 8 a.m., we had some picketers in the street with signs. And um, after we did a, a phone zap the previous week, um, having folks call into grid management to compel them to negotiate with their tenants, um, we showed up for a, a meeting there and negotiated the non-negotiable lease. Oh, yeah. And that didn't just help the tenants in this building, but um, other tenants um, uh, of GRID across the city, those who you know um, heard about it called GRID and said, hey, we want what they got. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh, and, right. uh, and, they, and they got it. Uh -huh. um, so we've done some of that. That's, we really, that, that is sort of what we want to be spending the most time doing is organizing mm -hmm. um, tenants to... Uh, you know, defend their homes and demand uh, dignity and kind of take back their, their power. Uh, we've also done some um, political work. Uh, Commissioner Udaly was um, an, an early card-carrying member of, of Portland Tenants United, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, sat on our steering committee very briefly um, until she won the primary and thought it best to, um, to oh, step back. Sure. But uh, we don't formally endorse any candidates. But of course, you know, she is a tenant. Um, she uh, was instrumental in, in um, you know, helping raise the volume on this issue. And so she spoke at a lot of our events. A lot of us volunteered and canvassed for her. And um, we really, uh, you know, we really it involved ourselves in the campaign as much as possible to make sure that the tenants' rights platform was a mandate um, mm -hmm. if she won. Um, we worked on Mayor Wheeler's campaign, again, also unofficially, but kind of agitationally. Um, you know, hey, wh what are you doing about tenants' rights? Don't oh, you want to? Yeah. Right. And um, got him to um, adopt the Tenants' Bill of Rights. Um, we um, helped the community see that Jules Bailey was not interested in <laughs> mm -hmm. adopting tenants' rights. Um, we participated in a mayoral forum where um, every single candidate um, 
talked about uh, having um, reducing um, screening barriers in order to make access to housing easier for marginalized people who, who struggle um, not even just to pay the rent, but even to be approved to get in oh. to housing for a litany of factors. And so we just, you know, we, I feel like we have um, really worked hard to bring the issue of tenants' rights um, into the conversation mm -hmm. of affordable housing, housing affordability, the housing crisis, um, and make it uh, not a fringe issue, mm -hmm. um, but make it a, you know, a kitchen table conversation with uh, our yeah. elected leaders. Yeah, no, I, I think you've really been very effective at doing that uh, because, uh, you know, this is, you know, the owners and the managers are all very organized mm -hmm. and they get their voices and tenants usually are so disorganized that they can't speak or exert any influence and you've been able to do that. And part of that disorganization is us, you know, is, is it's on purpose. Um, you know, when you, when there's no guarantee that you can make a home out of your rental home because mm -hmm. you never know after that next rent increase or that no cause yeah. eviction. Um, or, you know, the, the home is so uninhabitable that it's making you and your family sick and you're too scared to ask to get it re uh, fixed or the landlord just says no because yeah. they know that you have nowhere else to go. Um, you know, it's really isolating. It's really disempowering. Um, you don't feel, you don't get to know your neighbors and your community and, and feel um, so in solidarity with them because you just assume that it's kind of a transient s uh, station in life mm -hmm. uh, that to a certain extent you deserve it as a renter. You know, if you really, uh, we hear this all the time, if you, if you want housing security, just buy a house, um, <laughs> which is a, a great solution for the very, you know, specific uh, yeah. pop percent of the population <laughs> who can afford it. it. But, yeah. but how do we, so that means we accept the, you know, just the disempowering um, and, you know, inhumane conditions um, mm -hmm. for the rest of the population. I mean, we just, yeah, yeah. we can't, we can't abide by that, mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> so uh, talk a little bit about the specific policies that you have endorsed or, or supported or advanced. So um, our Tenants Bill of Rights um, is, has three components and all of the policies fit into that. So we have, um, I'll start with the right to remain. Um, and that is really about security of tenure. Once you move into a rental home, uh, provided you follow the rules and you know are a good neighbor, you um, should be able to stay in that rental home for as long as you want and build, uh, build community there. Um, and to whatever extent uh, that's not possible because you don't actually own the home and the land, uh, it, it should be hard to move you and the financial consequences should be mitigated. So. We've advocated for just cause evictions rather than no cause evictions. So mm -hmm. you can't, um, you, when you uh, force a tenant out, you have to give them a reason. Um, those reasons might be the four cause reasons like non-payment of rent or violating the lease. We have a very efficient, you know, the state of Oregon is, um, a, a eviction is the second fastest, um, cheapest and most efficient civil legal procedure in the state behind getting a restraining order. Oh, really? Yes. Because uh, to, So it does not listen, take months and millions oh, of dollars. <laughs> because you know, when you listen to the, to, to, the, to the owners, it takes forever and it's almost impossible. No, it's okay, well, this, thank it's you. It's really not. Um, and that, you know, lack of education there is, a, is, a, is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other set would be maybe what we'd call no-fault evictions. And that's if an owner is going to sell or do significant um, renovations or rehab, um, move in or move a fa uh, family member in, or, you know, other ways sort of take it offline, take it out of the um, residential rental housing market. Um, and those would be no-fault evictions. Um, and in a perfect world where we've ended no cause evictions, those no fault evictions would then come with a relocation payment to offset mm -hmm. the, um, the significant costs of moving. Now, um, the city of Portland uh, finds that it is not able to end the practice of no cause evictions, that it's preempted by state law. So we um, uh, you know, helped uh, work on the Portland's relocation ordinance that was passed very shortly after Commissioner Udaley came into office. Mm -hmm. And that relocation ordinance says that if a landlord gives a no cause eviction, which unfortunately are still allowed, or a rent increase of 10% or more, um, that the tenant 
decides they cannot afford that you know it, um, will compel their displacement, then the landlord has to pay that tenant um, between $2,900 and $4,500, depending on the size of the unit, to relocate. So that was a big policy win um, for us. Uh, the landlords immediately sued and said that it was rent control, and we um, won. Um, the, oh, the judge oh. agreed very, very strongly with us that it was not rent control. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has probably been our, our biggest victory. Uh, we kind of played a supportive role um, um, in the most recent legislative session, um, the Stable Homes Coalition, um, comprised of some statewide organizations, some tenants, some legal, some um, intersectional organizations, just uh, ad um, ad tried to advance a bill through the legislature that would have ended no cause evictions, replaced them with a just cause standard. It would have given three months rent relocation for the no faults. Uh, the bill, that part was largely um, reduced. And it would have lifted the ban on rent control because the other piece of this obviously is getting to the $500 rent increases. Because oh. even if you end no cause evictions, if you can just give a $500 rent yes. increase or $1,000 mm -hmm. rent increase, it's the it's same the problem. Same thing. So yeah. are the relocation ordinance gets to that with the 10% rent um, cutoff. Mm -hmm. um, but really lifting the ban on rent control allows local jurisdictions like the city of Portland or Multnomah County or, or wherever it um, is to to enact a policy that um, can respond to um, five hundred dollar rent increases or doubling mm -hmm. the rent or you know raising rents on seniors or you know new mothers mm -hmm. or you know whatever it is. Uh, it anything that aims to say how much you are allowed to raise the rent by is considered um, rent, control. rent control. And so okay. right now right. it's totally legal to give a $1,000 rent increase and it is illegal to do anything about it. <laughs> okay. All right. that's, uh, that's a good way of framing so we, so we understand mm -hmm. what the situation is. So what happened in the legislature? So HB 2004, mm -hmm. was that the bill that we that were was talking the bill. about? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. And what happened with that so bill? So it started off, I mean, it was a great bill as introduced um, based on um, you know precedents um, of similar policies across the, the country and in North America and uh, you know research base informed by economists and urban planners. Um, a lot of support from the legislature as well. It passed the House with um, some, some substantial cuts but still acceptable cuts. Um, it, it introduced exemptions for landlords with four or fewer units. They wouldn't have to pay the relocation. Mm -hmm. I believe it lowered the relocation from three months rent to one month rent and then it would have still allowed no cause evictions for six months. Um, and then it went to the Senate, and the Senate um, was where uh, it w really just was gutted um, in, in large part. Uh, the landlord, uh, landlord lobby formed a new PAC just in the wake of, um, of all of these conversations late last year. They said, you know, landlords are under attack. <laughs> they formed a new PAC, literally committed to defeating any attempt at um, stronger tenant protections in the legislature. Um, they gave uh, Senator Rod Monroe, a Democratic senator from East Portland, um, ten thousand uh, dollars, which I believe was his largest campaign donation in a very, very long wow. time. Mm -hmm. um, they gave Senator uh, Betsy Johnson, um, Democratic Senator Betsy Johnson, ten thousand um, dollars. Lee Beyer and Eugene, who is uh, not—I don't know that he's in an official leadership position, but he's a very influential member mm -hmm. of the Senate, um, was also given ten thousand dollars, I believe. Um, Alan DeBoer, a Republican in Ashland, who um, I, I don't know about very much about Southern Oregon politics, but my understanding was that he was a Republican who could be moved to vote on this bill um, if for no other reason than by very strong pressure um, from his constituents who mm. um, are hurting very deeply from mm. the housing crisis in the Ashland, Medford area. He took $20,000 uh -huh. and put the bill on the bad bill list for Republicans. So Republicans were just not allowed to vote for it. Mm -hmm. So we have 17 Democrats, we need 16 to pass it. Um, and Monroe and Betsy Johnson had uh, dug their heels in, um, which only gave us you know, 15 potential votes. We had mm -hmm. a handful of conservative Democratic senators who were, we knew that they would vote yes if it got to the floor. Uh, they had also taken money from the landlord lobby and were very interested in, um, in you know, amending that bill down as much as possible um, to you know make it as as, as palatable as possible and as ineffective. Right, yeah. uh -huh. And and ultimately there were two sets of amendments um, and uh, that 
didn't just significantly weaken it. Um, you know, I think when you try to decide is something better than nothing, it's a really hard question mm -hmm. to answer. Um, and Portland Tenants United struggled with, for example, losing the ban on rent control. You know, we really felt strongly about that. But having a strong just cause um, law uh, will st would still do a lot to advance housing security um, and protect tenants, especially those outside of Portland who don't yeah. have the relocation ordinance. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. But then it was uh, essentially the just cause protections ended up only applying to a certain class of tenants. And... Um, and all you know, landlords were just going to put everybody else in this other class in order to get around them. Uh -huh. And this other class came with additional obligations and financial risks for tenants. So it was like, so the, nobody gets these protections, and the tool to get around it can hurt tenants. And that was where mm -hmm. we said. So you ended up opposing the bill entirely. Okay. We, we withdrew support, and and um, and we didn't we didn't encourage it to fail but, but we, it did fail it did fail right, yeah so yeah. in about a minute what's the next steps for you um well we're going to continue to build power through organizing in the portland metro area grow our membership and and help folks realize they're not alone and this is not normal and natural and we are going to work very hard on preserving and strengthening portland's relocation ordinance when it's up for renewal in september or october and mm -hmm. expanding it um uh, as much as possible in the metro area and trying to support any efforts to expand it elsewhere in the state. Okay. All right, so we've had your contact information on the screen, so if people want to get involved, activate it, they should contact you. They absolutely should. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. All I really right. appreciate the time. Yeah, great. So we've been talking with uh, Margot Black, organizer with Portland Tenants United, NAFTA. President Trump will be renegotiating this 23-year-old 23, 23 trade agreement with Mexico and Canada beginning in uh, mid-August. Let your U.S. senators and representatives know what you want as a result of those negotiations. Alliance for Democracy and our fair trade allies have four requirements for a fair trade deal for the to benefit the people of all three nations. Among them is that the investor state dispute settlement clause of the current NAFTA must be eliminated. This clause has allowed multinational corporations to sue if they think changes to laws reduce their future profits. This is a direct attack on democracy. V visit the Alliance for Democracy website to read the rest of the requirements, print postcards that can be mailed to your U.S. Uh, senators and representatives to get them thinking about what we really need, not what multinational corporations want. Learn more at the Portland Alliance for Democracy website, afd-pdx.org. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.